and start that. All right. All right. Well, good morning. Today is Monday, uh, the day after Palm Sunday. Uh, this week, what I'm going to do is take a slight detour from uh, the book of Ephesians that we've been studying, and we're celebrating the Passion Week. Uh, how many of you went to church yesterday and uh, heard a Passion sermon? Um, and of course, the Passion Week starts with the triumphal entry of Jesus coming through the Eastern Gate. And uh, so today and tomorrow, uh, we'll see how long it takes me. I'm going to do a, a special message on the triumphal entry, and then, of course, the crucifixion and the resurrection Sunday. So, uh, very holy week for Christians all around the world. So, I figure it would definitely be worth our time to take a detour and uh, take a look at uh, the Passion Week together. So, <clears throat> let's go ahead and open up our Bibles to two places. We're going to go to Luke uh, chapter number 19 and verse number 28. Uh, Luke chapter 19 and verse number 28. And then also open your Bibles to Daniel uh, chapter number 9. And that's where we're going to spend most of our time between Luke 19 and Daniel chapter number 9. And we're going to read that together, okay? Right after Ezekiel. There we go, Daniel chapter number 9. All right, let's go ahead and read Luke. We're going to read Luke um, chapter 19, verses 28 through 40 together. Luke uh, 19, 28 through 40. And when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he came was come nigh to Bethpage at Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering ye shall find a colt tied, where on yet never man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. And if any man ask you why ye loose him, thus shall ye say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way, and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. So here we have the triumphal entry of Jesus coming through the eastern gate. And um, we see that Jesus is up on the Mount of Olives with his disciples just outside the eastern gate. And he sends two of them ahead of him and says, Go loose a donkey that's never been rode. And if, he, and if the owner comes out and says, What are you doing? Then just tell him that the master has need of it. And then bring it to me. They bring it to Jesus. They set him on it. And they bring him down the Mount of Olives. And he enters through the eastern gate in what is commonly known as the, the triumphal uh, entry. Now, what I want to do is I want to go over to Daniel chapter number 9. You see, Daniel in the Old Testament actually prophesied this very day. It is one of the greatest prophecies in all of Scripture. Daniel foretells the exact day that Jesus would come through this eastern gate. Uh, and we're going to look at some things. For example, before we go over there, if you look in uh, Luke, back over in Luke, uh, chapter number 19, and look where we left off um, in verse number 41. And when he was come near, he beheld the city, and he wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy 
day. The things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from your eyes. Jesus is referring to a day, a specific day in history that was foretold in the Old Testament by the prophet Daniel. So now in Daniel chapter number 9, we're going to take a look at that day. Daniel chapter number 9 and verse number 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over all of the realm of the Chaldeans. Now, notice it says in the first year of Darius. Darius came to the throne in 538 BC. We know that from history. And notice verse number 2. In the first year of the reign of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Here we see that Daniel was apparently a student of scripture and he had apparently been studying the book of Jeremiah or the scroll of Jeremiah and he came upon a prophecy. What prophecy was that? Well it had to have been Jeremiah chapter number 25. Look in your Bibles with me. Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse number 11. In Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse number 11. This is where Daniel had to have been reading. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 25 verse number 11. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. You see, Jeremiah foretold of the Babylonian captivity and even said how long it would last. And notice in verse number 12, And it shall come to pass, when seventy years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon, and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity in the land of the Chaldeans, and will make it a perpetual desolation. So Dan, Jeremiah foretold the Babylonian captivity and even said how long it would last and how it would end. Look in Jeremiah chapter number 29 and verse number 10. Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse number 10. For thus saith the Lord, after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you in causing you to return to this place. Now he's telling them, after the 70 years of Babylonian captivity, I will bring you back to Jerusalem. And he says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. So when Daniel here, in Daniel chapter number 9, says that he understood by the books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Daniel was reading from Jeremiah 25 and Jeremiah chapter number 29. Now, history tells us that Israel had been destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar in 605 BC. So historically that means, or numerically that means, that the Jews had already been in Babylonian captivity for 67 years at the time Daniel is writing this in chapter number 9. Okay? And now Daniel knows that the Babylonian captivity is over. You know, one, just a sidebar. I believe the Bible should be taken literally unless there are portions of scripture or where it so indicates that it should not be taken literally. Um, you know, why is it that Bible scholars today can't seem to do this? I mean, they make every excuse under the sun not to take something at face value. I mean, did he really mean 70 years? Was he speaking metaphorically? Well, you know, in the original Greek. Well, you know, when the, when the Bible says that in six days he created the heavens and the earth and on the seventh day he rested, that those six days, you know, the Lord said a day is the Lord is as a thousand years, so six thousand years, and you know, we try to twist the scriptures. I believe that when it says in six days the Lord created the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested, 
I believe that means that in six days the Lord created the heavens and the earth and on the seventh day he rested. Let me tell you what the problem is. We come to the scriptures with a preconceived idea or a preconceived notion and we try to twist or rest the scriptures, unfortunately, to our own destruction to fit that preconceived notion. Instead of just reading what the Bible says, taking it at its normal, usual, grammatical face value, we twist it to make it say something that it doesn't say, but to fit what we already want it to say. Why can't we take the Bible just at face value? You know, John wrote in 1 John, I write these things that you may know. He didn't say, I write these things that you may guess. I write these things that you can take your worldview and, and force it upon the text. He said, I write these things that you may know. We need to stop the second guessing God. You know, where God has put a period, we need to not put a question mark. You see, when the Bible says the children of Israel exited out of Egypt and came to the Red Sea, and Moses dropped his staff and the Red Sea parted and the Jew the, the Israeli the Israelites walked through on dry land. You know what that means? It means exactly what it says. But instead, now when I was a younger man and I sat in Old Testament survey class in in a particular school, not the one I graduated from at all, but I went to a school in, in South Carolina and I remember the professor saying, well, this actually was not the Red Sea. It was actually the Reed Sea, R-E-E-D. And the Reed Sea is not really much of a sea. It's only about ankle deep, um, you know, maximum knee deep. And the winds were blowing. And there's a certain uh, time of the year when these winds come around and it kind of push the water back so that it appeared to be something supernatural. You know, and I remember as clear as a bell, one of the students in the back of the class said, are, so are you, are you suggesting that Pharaoh's army drowned in ankle or knee deep water? You see, when you start twisting the scriptures to say something that they don't really say, um, you're going to end up twisting everything to make your idea fit. And eventually, you're not going to believe the Bible. And that's exactly what's happened today. That's exactly why our churches are deader than a doornail. Because we do not believe the Word of God. We think we are smarter than God. I'm a literalist, and I would encourage you to be one too. So, we've established that Daniel's in, in Babylonian captivity... We've established that he has read the book of Jeremiah, verses chapters 25 and 29, and he's found out that the Babylonian captivity, according to Jeremiah, was only going to be 70 years, and we know that they had been in Babylonian captivity up to this point 67 years. So Daniel knew that the Babylonian captivity was almost over. Tomorrow, what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to answer the question: Well, why seventy years of captivity? I mean, where did that random number come from? Why seventy years? Why only seventy years? Well, I'm going to give you a homework assignment before we come together tomorrow. I want you to read Leviticus chapter number twenty-five and chapter number twenty-six. That's when the law, the Levitical law, was given. And there is a, I guess you could call it a, uh, God tells them, he gives them a commandment in what we call the law of the Sabbath in regards to the land. And I want you to read Leviticus chapter 25 and Leviticus chapter number 27. And tomorrow we'll go through that and we'll see exactly why. Uh, they were exiled into Babylon for 70 years. Well, listen, guys, uh, remember every morning, 6.30, we're going to gather. Uh, if you want to be a part of this live feed, of course, the recordings are up for you to listen to at any time. And bear in mind that I will post the audio as well as the notes on the website. Well, God bless you guys. hope that you have an awesome day. Remember, the Lord loves you, wants the best for you, and he's working all things out for your good.